I was meditating on the Word of God, <laughs> I said, because like many of our leaders here, we just don't preach our favorite personal sermons when, when we go away. We, we listen to the Word of God, and we, we try our best to hear from Him and, and ask God that He gives us discernment so that we can impart something that you need from the Lord and learn from it so that it will not be a boring Sunday when you come, always expecting something fresh because every day Jesus is fresh. So I don't know of anyone whose Jesus is not fresh today. So jet lag is no reason for me not to preach the word with excitement. One day, and we are reading from 2 Kings chapter 6, 1 to 7. One day, the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, As you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Does that sound familiar here? You have a construction going on. It's getting smaller, you know, this place. Hmm. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs that we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them. Go ahead. Please come with us. Someone suggested, I will, he said. And these these are the, the, the students of Elijah, the group of prophets. They are leaders themselves. And when they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was chopping, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, my Lord, he cried. It was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water. And the axe head rose to the surface and floated. Do you know how heavy that metal piece is? You throw a stick and something comes out under the water and, and float like this stick. I know that we can relate in the natural what God is saying to us, but I want us all, including myself, to relate what God is saying in the spiritual sense. Because that's always the nature of Jesus. He tells us stories, but he doesn't stop with the natural stuff. There's always a, a, a deeper lesson that we can learn so that we can be the kind of person God has called us to be. A Christian who is strong, a Christian who is planted um, on the rock, not on sand. So that any trial, adversity that comes our way, our character is prepared to meet them all. Amen. We're strong. We are fortified. Because, well, we have Jesus with us. Amen? Amen. Now, let me just give you a little backdrop of what is going on in here. You go back to chapter 2 of 2 Kings, and this is where it's coming from. This group of prophets, there are 50 of them, very strong students of um, uh, the prophet Elijah. And this is the time where Elijah was going to be taken. This is that day. And somehow Elijah knows that he will be taken that way, that, that day. And... Uh, we remember that Elijah, Elijah said that I'm going to Bethel. But Elijah said he wouldn't let go of his master. Mm-hmm. Are there any people here who loves the, the man that God set for his church? The pastor. Or you'd rather say goodbye to pastor. Pastor, I don't need you anymore or what? I have my own now. But this man, Elijah, said, I, I, I want to be with you. I will always be with you. I will never leave you. And then the man of God said, again, oh, God is sending me to Jericho. And the same thing Elisha said, I will go with you. I will never leave you. But to some people in the church, bye-bye, pastor. I don't need you anymore. The third time, Elijah said, the Lord is sending me to the Jordan River. And Elisha said the same thing. Elisha said the same thing. Now that day, 
the man of God will be taken away. They don't exactly know how he will be taken, but that day was the day that was prophesied that Elijah will be taken by the Lord. Now, the group of prophets said to Elijah, do you know that he will be taken away today? And sometimes we tell our pastor things. Yeah? And as if they were testing their their would-be next leader, I go, yes, I know, Elisha said. But the group of prophets thought that he will be taken away by the Lord, and he's going to die, and they will still see the body there. And the third time that Elijah asked, Elisha asked Elijah about his being taken away, he asked something. When God takes you away, would you favor me something? And he did ask that, and Elijah said, that's a very difficult request. However, if God will not give you that, before I leave, you will not get it. But if you see me taken, you will get it. Mm. So if you leave your master here, you won't get it. You won't see it. <laughs> you must be there. So there is a pattern and an order in the spiritual realm that we cannot violate with our mental or, or physical Oh, longing. The same is true with Paul saying to the people that you cannot accomplish in the flesh what is already set in there in the spirit. Amen. For what the flesh wants, the spirit doesn't want. What the spirit wants, the flesh doesn't want. Galatians 5, you know there's a struggle every moment between the flesh and the spirit. And Paul said, I pray that your spirit will prevail over the flesh. Familiar? How many times have we failed in that area? Mm. Pastor, you're too strict. I won't come to your church again. (laughs) And so, Elijah was taken away, and they were looking for that successor. When he was taken away, Elisha saw it. Fast forward, Elisha went to pick up the mantle of Elijah and used it to cross back the Jordan River and the group of prophets saw it. He is the anointed man of God. So they went to follow him. And they asked him, well, we need to find where uh, your master went, where his body was laid. Maybe he's up on the mountain like Moses. Maybe he's, he's there on the ground in the valley or what. And he said, don't worry about it, Elisha said. But they insisted, all right, go then. And sometimes the spiritual father of the church, they, they tell him what to do. And they won't listen. And the spiritual leader says, okay, go then. And they will end up coming back. And, and this is what happened with the uh, group of, of, of prophets. Students, you know, when I was in the political spectrum, when I was walking with congressmen or, or senators in the Philippines, I feel like I'm the, the congressman. I feel like I'm the senator. Do you feel that sometimes? When you're in Bible school, when, when somebody preaches so good, you, you feel, oh, that's my teacher. And you feel like you are the teacher with the, the same power and anointing, but you're still learning. But sometimes we have to push what we want. You young people, be careful, all right? You will have your time. Just train hard for now. But the man of God that is so crafted by the Lord, he knows what he's doing because his power, his authority is the Lord himself. Assignment comes from the Lord for a man or a woman of God standing here. It's a big mistake for, for pastors or preachers, whoever that is called behind the pulpit to preach the word of God, whose authority is from men. Because we are preaching the spiritual message, and it's from the Lord. 
And so, sometimes this group of prophets, I do understand their feeling now. I was younger. I was just like them. But I can understand their behavior now. Gone through the process. I wish I did not go through the process. But just the same, God recovered me. And there's a point in where I am now, where you are at, with the lesson that God will bring us today about the axe head. Have you seen an axe before? Is it sharp or what? Now, I want to I wanna ask you, if you were that axe head, are you sharp or dull? Okay, we'll find out, we'll find out, we'll find out. If it is sharp, oh, bravo. But you have to use it. If it is dull and you use it, ah, you need this message too. So, same thing. You see, God has got a sense of humor. And when we understand how, how God lays out these messages to his people, and, and we learn from, from it, it's exciting to be in the presence of God. Amen. It is. And, and being a child of God is never, never, never boring. And so, Elijah was taken, Elijah was taken by the Lord, a chariot of fire. How would you like to be taken by the Lord with a charge of the fire? Amen. Some people, they can't wait, so they, they get cremated. <laughs> the <chariot of> fire. <laughs> I, there's no chariot, but there's fire. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's just the shell. That's just the covering, so it doesn't matter anymore. All of us, we need to, to take care of our spiritual man. Because that is the one that is so important before the Lord. And that is what the devil is trying to remove from us. The spiritual part of us. Because that's the one that never sees. And she says that that's the one that never dies. Because the Lord said that even if you die, you shall live Amen. forever. Is that not a good message to preach? Yeah. And I get so excited, and I don't see why people get, like, when you say, I'm going to live forever? Yeah. Here's an anti-aging cream. Use it, and they smile. When you tell them about the salvation of the Lord, they pout. <laughs> Man, it, it doesn't make sense. Where's the excitement? So a little bit of them, the prophets, and they said that, oh, pl the place is too small for us now. We can provide you 50 strong students who can help build a bigger place. One beam each. One log each. How about you? Have you helped in building this structure here? Not yet. Oh, you're just watching. Are you over the fence? What are they doing? <laughs> and you're a part of the church and you go... Oh, they're building again. But these guys, they say, come on, let's help out. One log each. While they're in the process of, of cutting trees, the axe fell into the water, not underground. It must be deep. They couldn't find it. And the man of God said, or should I say in vernacular, their pastor said, where did it fall? He cut a stick and throw that stick, and that thing went afloat. Man, that's faith. That's faith. That's faith. Your set man will always be there for you, whether you like it or not. Whether you feel you are not taken care of or not, he will be there for you in God's perfect time. Even Jesus. When his disciples said, they, they're calling out for you, your friend Lazarus is dying. He did not go right away there. But Jesus knew what he was doing. You see, can you see the flesh and the spirit playing up? It's more exciting in the spirit than in the flesh. It is. 
That's why when you experience miracle, you, whew, you are so empowered, enabled, and refreshed, only to go back to lose your axe head again till the next miracle comes. They said that I'm a long-winded preacher. The last time I came here, I preached twice, I think, and we ended up like finishing at 3 o'clock. And then I said, I, I sent a woman here by the name of Pastor Lynette, and he did, she did the same thing. Now I said, I'm going to learn this time. It will be short and sweet according to the time God has given me, okay? Amen. <laughs> but I don't think so. We're going to have a good time. See, you, you know how it feels like when you are jet lagged? You're excited. I am excited. I am really excited. You know, when the word of God is preached, I am excited. Why? Maybe you haven't read your Bible yet. I deviate a little bit. Because when the word of God is preached according to the book of Peter, angels are watching what that word will, will do. So as I preach the word of God, I know that there are scribes, angels, recording my message. Message that comes from the Lord. And they're watching for that word to do its work. Remember? The word of God will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose with which God had sent it. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Now, the Lord is not releasing words that are empty. That's right. If I were you, whatever you hear today and from now on, when you hear the word of God, he's talking to you, watch out for that word, and there's someone recording that. When the word comes to you, they record. Was she listening or is she listening or what? Oh, Pilar, Pilar was doing texting inside the church. When go. <laughs> oh, 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 they were talking about their neighbor who just had a fight. And go. Oh, they were talking about the food they ate yesterday. <laughs> they hear the word of God. Oh, yeah. John said, oh, he heard it, but he heard it. Get out. Of the other ear. You know that's how. Will you be that person? That's why God will take an account of whatever you do. So when you meet Jesus and they say, this is you. Huh? Who's recorded? <laughs> and you don't get a reward for that. You miss another crown of life. You know what you're missing? My goodness. In my church, I go... They're doing this. And one time, I asked, what are you doing? Oh, taking notes from you, Pastor, from your sermon. <laughs> and then there's this iPhone, and they're going like this. And what are you doing? I'm searching for the scripture. That's all right, I said. But let me advise you when you come to church, will you bring your... Your, your, your notebook and your pen so that you can write that. Sometimes you cannot write in here and you might accidentally delete it. <laughs> but here we are in the introduction of the message. You see how, how long I'm preaching. Amen. But there are only two points, the introduction and some lessons that uh, I have gathered from this word of God that God placed in my heart. And I'm so excited to share this with you because I know that somewhere in your life you can relate to this story. It may have been a very simple illustration, but it's so full of, of um, profound miracles. As I, I get older in life, I begin to value it. Not because I'm aging, but because I have missed so much of the things that God made for me. I missed a lot in my life. However, the Lord said, it's never too late. Amen. It's never too late. Now, the first thing that I observed here is that the tool that they needed to cut trees or logs got lost. It got lost. Today, 
for our purpose, that tool can be anything. What is that tool? What is your axe head? It can be, what, an evangelistic ministry? You should have been out there preaching the word of God. But you're not doing it. They're lost somewhere. Maybe your accent is praise and worship. But you're not there. They're lost somewhere. Maybe somebody told you that, don't join the praise and worship anymore. They're just them. The special people. Son of pastor, son of elder. Son, you will have no place in there. And somebody tells you, oh, okay, I won't go there anymore. But that's your accent. You know that very well in your heart. Oh, maybe your accent is you're a prayer warrior. You should pray. The last time I came here, there were people praying here. The accent was lost. The people got lost too, I think. <laughs> now that's a, a double whammy. But it's not about people. It's about the enemy stealing. Steal, kill, and destroy. But if you guard your spiritual man, he can take anything he wants. You're still there standing. So be careful of who's whispering which. <laughs> if you have the Lord with you, you protect your ministry. You protect your accent. Sharpen it all the time. Yeah. Don't listen to other voices. Listen to the voice of God where he's planted you. Yeah. Because the training of the Lord is different. As he said in his word in the book of Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. We may feel sometimes that we are the grief party, but God is doing something, removing the dross in you. Amen. Remember Moses? He was sent to the palace. He was protected there. He was reared there. He grew up there, became a, a prince. He was well loved. But God is a mission for him. God has given him an accent that he can sharpen, but because of his background, he has to be squeezed to the full until it's him and the Lord. No more beautiful palace, no more favors, nothing. And that's why the next 40 years, he stayed in the wilderness. When he was ready, he came back. And we think when somebody said to us, a church, do this, do that, or should not do this, should not do that. And you go, whoo, sobra naman si pastor. Bye-bye, church. I mean, those are petty things. If, if we understand in the spirit what God is doing, you will enjoy more. Persevere. Uh, discern what God is telling you to do. But all those Men and women who have been tested in ministry, they go through severe fire of testing mm -hmm. until it's, it's between you and the Lord. It's not anybody else. It's not somebody else dictating you what to do, but you and God. And remember this, you will have a joyful relationship with the Lord regardless of what happens to you. Why? Because we have the promise of the Lord. And he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Between the words of man and the words of Jesus, where would you rather be? Jesus. And so, listen to this one. The axe head was lost. What is your axe head? Maybe God has given you the ministry to encourage people. Maybe not a pastor, but an encourager. When will you encourage that person? On a Sunday? Or include Saturday? How about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? You encourage people. Hmm. Isn't that good? Oh, if you have that, that accent, you begin encouraging yourself. Now. 
Because it's so wonderful. Anything that the Lord gives is wonderful. What is in your hand? Moses said, I'm going to face the Egyptian king, Pharaoh, and what will he say to me? If I say one word that is not suitable for his hearing, I'm going to be a lichun. Gonna roast him today. <laughs> but I cannot speak. What's in your hand? Stuff. And we think sometimes what's in our hand is not enough. And the Lord said, That's enough. Even Jesus demonstrated this principle in feeding the 5,000. And the disciples said, Oh, Pastor, sino magdadala ng pinakbit? Sino nagpapadala ng papaitan? Who are going to bring this? Who going to bring we, It's on our anniversary. There will be lots of people in the church. Of course, they're all good things. The Lord will touch people to bring something. See, in my church now, we, we don't do so much of those things that who will bring this one? Oh, yeah, we still ask, but it's not a problem like, oh, ikaw na, you bring the adobo, okay? You have to force that, you have to say that 20 times to bring the adobo. <laughs> now we don't. Like the family of Respicio will bring pancit. The family of the family of this will bring this. The family of this. And we have an overflow of food. And people come and eat and have banquet. And after they eat, we, or before even they eat, we bring them the best food there is. The word of God. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything shall be added unto you. Now, when you see that scripture coming into reality in the spirit realm, you will never be the same again. Never again. That is why we love the word of God. It's so real. It's a double-edged sword. And I'm so amazed because I never went to Bible school. And God gave me the discernment, the wisdom, and understanding and the Holy Spirit to understand the Word of God. Of course, we have some kind of training also, that, but that's part of it. But there's nothing like you're hearing the voice of God and doing it, Amen. even if you don't feel like doing it. That's right. But it's in trusting the Lord. Something is happening here in this story. So what is your axe head? Maybe your axe head is giving love and comfort. Maybe taking care of the widows, the orphans. I don't know. I see during youth camps, and we see the young people come forward, and they cry. Uh, something so deep within them. But they cannot express and, and even explain away what that feeling is they are going through at the time. I know that because as a young, I love young people. And I don't want to miss any youth camp for that matter. And God is doing something amazing. And I remember Pastor Rick DeFunturum when he was still a superintendent. And I think that was some years back, five years. And he asked me, Brother Ben, what do you see amongst our young people? Well, definitely, Pastor, they are so anointed and they so much gift and talents that the Lord has given our young people. And I like them. They, they have that camaraderie and friendship. They, they, they love one another. They have their own heartaches and pains in the family and within their circle of friendships. But one thing I have noticed, I said, because I see you guys, when, when, when the convention or church service is finished, you, you go out and eat. When the Bible study is finished, you go out and eat. You stay until 9 o'clock or 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, having fun. And I go, I believe 
that the Lord is saying to us that they need more of the Word of God. And that was years back when I saw it. The Word of God as we understand it in the Spirit so that they can take it with them when they grow up and a good example for the next generation. Oh, we don't want to see, I don't want to see these young people growing up and they're only good when it's praise and worship time. <laughs> yay! Yay! <laughs> and where there's a trial, <laughs> don't know what to do. At a young age, you can fortify yourselves with the Word of God. Amen. It's more exciting than any tool you can find on the face of this earth. Do you want to do miracles? You can feed the people two fish and five loaves. Lord, that was your time, I said. I was doing a crusade in the Philippines. And uh, on the first night, there were lots of salvation. And there were lots of healing that was happening. Actual, before my own eyes. Because I prayed, I want to see it too, Lord. And then... Well, the other leaders were ministering. We were in a huge stadium, the biggest stadium in the place where I was situated at, in the northern Philippines. And uh, the Lord told me to get all the radio stations and cable TV, so we were broadcasted to six million people in that area. And it amazes me how God works. And I... I heard audibly what the Lord said. Feed my people. See, thousands of them, Lord. 10.30 in the evening. And I had the superintendent of Spain at that time as my crusade director, Pastor Bobby Adnalin, who once said to me, I don't know what you have. He said, but you're so strict and to the point and in, in order... But we're talking about crusades. Pastor Bob, I said, and my orders are not coming from me. It's coming from the Lord. This is what we're going to do. You know, when God put instruction like that, we have to follow. Even if people didn't want it. And if, we, if I do that and they don't want it, well, they don't want it. I said, next. Because it's not mine. It, it, it's, it's the Lord's. I don't want to lose my axe head. I have to cut that thing sharp. But it's against all odds. As usual, like in the church. It's like, that will never happen, we say. But to the Lord, that's too easy. I mean, we have the David and Goliath too as an example. We like to tell it a story, but it happens in our lives. We don't want to apply that story. I mean, accident. And so I followed the Lord, and I, I announced it. And the people in their homes, who were the cooks, they, they were there at the church, at Tabernacle of Glory. They had to send two messengers, one at a time, to confirm what I said on TV was right. Feed my people. Prepare and feed everyone else who is left here. And there are thousands of them. And we have a small church. And we did have one lichon, I think. Uh, but we have sacks of rice that were donated, and they begin to cook. At 11 o'clock, people were marching towards that. It's from the stadium to the church. It's, a, it's 1,000 meters distance. You can ask Pastor Ed Malindis and, and his leaders. We never underestimate the work of the Lord. And at that time, I was living in Australia already. So, the Lord said, you just congregate there in the Philippines, and I'll give you instructions when you get there. And so that's what happened. And they were eating, marching, and getting plates. And I was looking at them, because I was the last one, almost the last one to go there. And people were marching back. She, where are you going? Go, oh, there's no space in Pastor Ed Malay's church. We better go back to the stadium. So they, they, they brought their food to the stadium. And I see like that someone's going, someone's coming back, and like this. At 11 o'clock. 
12 o'clock in the evening. And the neighbors were, have their open doors. What's happening here? There's a procession. Must be a Catholic procession here. <laughs> and at 2 o'clock in the morning, we debriefed. We're talking about sharpness of our acts. And then we suddenly, as, as if we were in a trance, and we woke up. But we were awake. And he said, what happened? Well, there's lots of food left. That sack of rice was never even touched. There was a miracle of the two fish and five loaves when, people, when God fed his people. And then six, from six o'clock in the morning to several days, we received calls of healings from different places. Those who watch on, the t- on their TV sets, those who listen to the radio, and we have to go and find out if the reports are true. And they were true. It's amazing when your ax head is sharp and you use it properly. What is your ax head? Have you lost it? Maybe you didn't lose it. Is it sharp? What did God give you to build his kingdom? Maybe it's just friendship. Maybe people are thinking I have to be a pastor in order for me to be effective in his kingdom. No way. You can be a sweeper. I remember when I started in the ministry, I was scared, running scared when they told me, you have to take the license. I'm okay where I am. But I did because my elders told me I have to take it. For whatever reason, I did take it. And when I got it, well, I remember the superintendent of Hawaii now, Pastor Rumbawa. When I was a boy, I knew in the church, in the assembly, Sister Diana prophesied at a meeting when Pastor Liberato was still alive. That boy, God wants to use that boy. And we were looking like this. And I was looking like this too. And then the people around me said, no, there was you. I said, I took it to heart. And I began the Lord. I began setting up chairs. I began um, picking up people to come to the church and bring them back home. I begin to um, socialize with the young people. And when Pastor Rombawa noticed that, um, you know, I, 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 I like to evangelize, when he, um, he was not yet a superintendent at that time, when he comes and preach in the mainland, he, he takes me with him, and I would carry his attache case. I, I would give him water. I would take his clothes, whatever I can help the man of God to do. And that's how I begin to meet the leaders of the assembly at a young age. I begin to meet Pastor Valle. Pastor Valle doesn't even remember. You remember that boy with Pastor Rumbawa? And I remember all of you here, I said. Oh, you were that boy. And I begin to get closer to um, Pastor Kanikoa. Pastor Liberato always wanted me to be at his place. And... I was like an adopted son of the Balangi family through my Ninang Clarita. And they begin to rear me up and take care of me and uh, tell me stories about so many things about Pastor Balangi and the Balangi children and their ministries and all that. I'm seeing things at a young age. And I was even sent to the Philippines to visit all the churches from Manila to Cagayan. And it took me three days to do that. I have vivid memories of all these things. And it was hard at that time. 
I said, Lord, where are you leading me? Are you doing your ministry well? Have you lost that anointing? You see, the axe head fell, and they had a question, a valid, legitimate question. Say, how are we going to finish this? Have you been at some point in that situation? Let me paraphrase that. You lost your job. You're paying a mortgage. How are we going to pay for this now? We have a problem. A big one. We have a huge project in the church. How much will going to cost this? 220000 220000 How are we going to do this? Well, use the bank. Because the bank gets people's money too anyway. We just borrow people's money from the bank too. So people think like, oh, too much utang. You know? Well, anyway, the bank is just borrowing the money of people anyway. Why don't use it to your advantage if you have a legitimate project? You think differently. You have to be sharp. You do the ministry. Say, so how do we finish the project? How do we get wood now? <clears throat> Filipinos are good at this one anyway. You can always resource anything. What are we going to do? What are we going to do, Pastor? What are we going to do now? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What am I going to do? I, by Amun, never mind. Uh, let's go find someplace else where we are comfortable. Ooh, I have only five dollars already. Don't underestimate God. All of a sudden, in one stroke, everything stops. Can you relate to that? At some point in your life, there's something that is stopped just so suddenly because of one scenario. I was planning on coming here, safe, sound, everything in order. I have my finance sorted out. I know where to get it. But I've been praying because I do real estate back home to, um, to feed my family and to support myself. I don't get salary from my church. I don't ask them anything. They were asking Pastor, we should support you and all that. That's fine. You can do that if you like. And I quit my job. But in the meantime, that you're not doing it. I'm not enforcing that. I am not forcing you to do it. And I'll, I'll do my thing. But anyway, what's in your hand? God blessed me with a business deal before. And I was working with a construction company. And I sold a lot of their houses. And I'm expecting about <clears throat> 47000 in commission. So everything, my finance and all that, I've, I've set everything. But he reneged on his promise. He never paid me. So I took him to court. I won a judgment. But, you know, having a legal mind myself, I know the process. Even if I did get a judgment, there's still about a month or six months for that judgment to be promulgated. And the convention is getting nearer and all that. In the meantime, I do have still a mortgage, and the bank keeps pressing me. I don't have much money at this time. How will I pay them back? And I have a baby, an 18-month-old baby. And these are happening 
so close to the convention and all that, and I have to give some no, uh, enough notices for the people. But my heart, I want to go there. Not because I want to say, I'm present. <sighs> That's very childish. You come from a very far away place and you go, I'm present at the convention. Australia, present! <laughs> well, you come to church on Sunday and you go, Balangi, present! You know, and then something happened. At two o'clock in the morning, see, my 18-month-old baby was crying. It was my time to, to stay, stay with her. And I was carrying her, and I was all over these inadequacies, adversities, and trials. I'm going to lose my axe head, and I begin to cry. It's been a long time since I asked, God, are you still there for me? Mm-hmm. I was crying. I feel like crying again. Are you, are you there for me? At first, you took me from the Philippines to America, and, and you floated me around, and you took me to Australia. and all that. I followed you, Lord, as you said. I don't know why I was doing that. I was just getting emotional to my dad yeah. in heaven. And the following morning, I, I felt good inside. And I felt bad too because of how I talked to my father in heaven. I cannot afford a lawyer myself, although I can represent myself. But someone whom I invited, who is a lawyer, came to preach at the church. And he, she was able to resource another lawyer to help me. It's not for free, but, uh, well, I can pay later. No, lawyers, you cannot do that. They want your money first, or 10% deposit, or 20% deposit, yeah, and they pressure you until they go the interest, and then get, until you become broke, I say. <laughs> but this one, it, it's there, and the bank was asking me, oh, they, one more, one more step, and they're going to, they're going to do your house a mortgagey sale. It's an auction. And even that real estate agent who is managing my property, he said, how, how much is the value of my property? It's two hundred to 205000 Only, I said, I bought it for two hundred eighty, and it's been four years. It should have appreciated in value, you know? But I didn't tell him that I am a real estate agent. And I said, I did not sell it because it's... It's, it's a lo- losing proposition. Until one day I remember I have another builder and I know I have money coming and I remember them saying, Ben, let us know how we can help you. And I said, I'll ask you when the time comes, but for now I'm, I'm okay. And suddenly the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, go tell those guys. I know they are strict too. And they have something in mind in return if we do the deal. You have to be strong. Some people uh, enter into a compromise when a situation happens like that in their lives. And I said to them, it's okay that the bank will get my, 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 my house. I have no problem with that. If they have to take it, then they have to take it. My life will not end there anyway. We can always replace that, even bigger ones. I've, I've seen a lot of people who have lost so many and come back. Yeah. Donald Trump is an example of that. 900 million in debt, and he was able to come back. And he is not a Christian. How much more me, I said. I'm a child of God. But anyway, in the end, I said to these other builders, okay, if you can support me here. And they're tying strings on me. and said, I don't want any strings attached. If you want to help me, if, if you really want to be generous, and you're after my well-being, that, that's fine. Because I train their salespeople about sales and, and all that. And we have a battery of, 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 um, of salesmen. 
in, in that company. And, that, and that's what I do also. See, the Lord has given us sometimes different axe heads that we can use. But anyway, cut a long story short, that's what happened. And they fixed the bank, and there was still extra money for me. And then the church said, Pastor, you can go. So I'm here. It was last minute. But you know how the Lord works? Pastor Phil is asking us to be at the convention, especially on Wednesday night. <laughs> oh, we are familiar with Pastor Phil. We know what he's going to say. <laughs> of course you don't know. Because it's God's moving. It's God's word. How can you predict God's word? We know that God's word is good. We know that God's word is powerful. But if you don't hear it, what's the use? And when we hear it and we don't appropriate it, what's the use? If we hear it, we appropriate it, we don't use it, what's the use? Oh, well, another one heating up the chair in the church. So I remember our church, the division that God gave to our church. And I, I know it by heart. And I always tell to the congregation what we are called for to do. We are an evangelistic church. We are a missionary church. We are a house of prayer. Outside of what God wants us to do here, we will never be as effective as in our real calling. So, what's our vision? I asked the church. Can even memorize it by heart. They don't know it. They just go, oh, we know. We know. Yeah, I know that already. And, and they try to say it. They, go, they, don't, they can say it. To be an effective, life-impacting soul-saving station in the 21st century and beyond. And you tell us why we go to the missions always in Cambodia. Cambodia is crying out for help. That's why I go there all the time. That's why I send our people all the time to Cambodia. We cry with them. We get sick with them. We laugh with them. We sing with them. We eat with them, except for the spiders they fried. I cannot eat it. <laughs> And that insect that looks like a cockroach, that one I can't. The locust? Maybe, yes, good. Ask Brother June La Pastora. Man, it's just so wonderful. Now they are, they are growing. And, and the outreaches are bigger than the churches. And so what shall we do? And they're crying out for help. And they're on voluntary job. Remember, they're Cambodians. Cambodian Christians. I said, wow. And I'm crying out for help. Even, even now, I, I can feel the pulse. And so I'm sending another one this September. What are the needs? Well, you have to compensate those sacrifices of those teachers in the villages. Now, $25 a month for one teacher is big. And I said to my people in the church, are there any volunteers here? So we are collecting again for this year for the teachers in Cambodia. We have about 25 in, 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 in the whole area. See, there are teachers who walk two hours just to go to the villages. There are some here who comes to church two hours late. <laughs> Sometimes cannot even reach the destination. So close and then turn back. Shame that the preaching is almost done. Lost the axe head. And when you go to the mission work and you see these people without even slippers and they go to church, they want to hear from the Lord. The, the first time I went there, the, the, the children were just singing in Cambodian. The second year, third year I went there, I see the children singing in English. Christian songs. And I said to my young people in the church, we are so comfortable where we are. Next trip, after you have done your America, I'll send you to Cambodia. 
away from the comfort zones and, and see reality at its best. Action. We have to be sharp now. Otherwise, the enemy will going to pulverize us. Not that they can kill our spirit, but then they can take away the joy of serving the Lord. The fellowship with God, which is so valuable and important in our relationship with Him. Why there is no joy in the church? Fellowship broken. Fellowship not related. Accent, lost. Accent, dull. In life, there is such a crisis event that will take place in the life of every believer, in the life of every church. What has been your crisis so far? I have just opened up to you my personal crisis that relates to what I want to do in the spirit. But I remain victorious today as I stand before you and tell you about the testimony of God in my life. How I was able to get here in such and such a time where I said, I cannot do anything more. My God, he read my heart. He wants, I want to come here and proclaim his goodness and his truth. The things that the church need to hear. Not to agree always with you, but even to disagree with you at some point. Just so you can relate to the goodness of God. I have recognized my God and I have pledged to him that I will not please men, but I will please you. I'd rather be approved of you than be approved of men, lest I will put my chairs, chair up and I get the glory and not you. It was hard to do that at first. So regardless of what I do, regardless of any position that I take, I am the same Ben. Whether I'm superintendent in Australia, whether I'm a pastor, whether I'm sweeping the floor and all that, I am Ben, a child of God. Amen. I remember the time that we, we were doing the church, and the church needs to be sharp. And no one wants to take care of setting up the church. You, you know, we have a storage there, and I'm, I'm so dressed up, I preach on a Sunday, and I'm the one putting the church up, I'm sweeping the floor. When we finished, it's the same thing. I pack up the church and I sweep the floor and my church members looking at me, watching, doing nothing. And I go, they have missed it. So you buried your talents, I'll take them all. Sweeping the floor, go around. Excuse me, your feet, please. <laughs> yeah. but they were thinking, oh, pastor is doing that. They, they don't mind. I don't care, I got your talent now. Oh, crown of life, I got them. You see, until three years later, they're beginning to step up. But I know what to do if they are not there. And the Lord is just saying, what is in your hand? What is your axe head? My axe head is always sharp. I was called and met Pastor Phil in Hong Kong. I was serving in Australia already. You know how long I've stayed in the streets of Australia? Two and a half years in torment, preaching the gospel there, rain or shine. And that was my ministry. That was my axe head. And still my axe head. I know when my axe head is dull. I know when it is sharp. Some people, they know, but they don't care. Based on feelings, based on intellect, that will never touch the spirit man. And the devil is so good in shutting us up because he uses the area of intellect and uses the area of feeling to shut us down. 
And when that is shut down, according to the devil, and to those who are not yet mature in the spirit, well, you cannot operate in the spirit. It's hard for faith to prevail in that sense. Have you seen that in the church? That's why when your ego is hurt, it's hard for you to do your ministry. The axe head is lost. And you see people coming out of that thinking that he was disqualified by someone, but they disqualified themselves. And the Lord allows that for them to realize what happens. And if they come back, they will come back. And we as ministers of the Lord, we always give that open door to those who want to come back because there's lots of prodigal sons and, and daughters up there, out there. And we don't discriminate on anyone. There's always a chance for them to come back. With the same position, maybe, maybe not. Because when you lose, lose that opportunity, when the door closes, when the Lord does that, you cannot open it back. The same thing, if he closes the other door, you cannot open it. When he closes, it, it's closed. Open, it's open. So you have to know the timing of God. So the ball is given back to you. What are you going to do with the ball now? You're going to shoot it or what? You're going to do a la Michael Jordan or what? Or James? Oh, whatever. <laughs> but you have to shoot that ball. Otherwise, your score, your score is still zero. You still have to try. And some people in my church, oh, thank you. They love to to sing. And sometimes, it's not the voice that you want to hear. <laughs> hmm? I have a member there who loves to sing. It's just the voice was not fit to the <laughs> other people. That's a female. And then another one stood up, a male this time. It's worse than the and they want to be both in the praise and worship team. And I said to them, we'll create two. One for them and one for you. But they love it. And I said, I, I'm not worried about how your voice sounds like. I want your heart. The same is true with the selected group of praise and, and, and worship uh, ministry. Because they can sing so well. But that's talent. I said, I want the heart. Yeah. That's right. Give me the heart. Because in the book of Amos, chapter 5, I knew it, that you, you can, it can be a beautiful music, a beautiful blending, or, or beautiful melody. But the Lord said, they're all noise to me because there's no heart flavor. But when you are singing in the Spirit, you, you get taken away like a chariot of fire. Amen. And you're drawn so close to God. It doesn't matter anymore how this orchestrated or how it sounds like your voice. You're engaged in the spirit. Amen. But there is such a ministry of music. And so I select also the best from the best. Team one, team two until we see the dynamics of it and they understand. We have to be sharp in praise and worship. And to be sharp, the initial stage is for us to set our hearts right before the Lord. Next, we use those talents and gifts because gifts and talents are without repentance. You can sing all you want, but that's fine because the Lord gave you that. He will going to use you still in that regard. But your joy is not full. Because the moment you stop singing, you are not, no longer singing in your heart. You, you don't have that joy that you experience here when you are on stage. Praising the Lord. You see, when I'm preaching at church, there's one who is so gifted and her role is in the kitchen. He's, her her. Acts in there is so sharp 
that it clashes with my sharpness sometimes. <laughs> At the end, almost the end of the service, of course, because after, after church, we always have nice lunch. You should come to Australia and experience this. I've been begging for three years not to put out lunch every Sunday, but just the generosity of the people. They, they no, Pastor, we do this. And they have fellowship, not harsh or, or um, distasteful fellowship. They talk about the Lord too, most of the time. And when I'm almost done, oh, I can smell the fish. <laughs> Tilapia. Cool. Oh my goodness, but I'm at the climax of my message. And there's this, this smell of food they are smelling. I said, I get interrupted sometimes. I go, can you close that kitchen? Can you turn the fire off? And can you cover that, that fish? But already, the smoke is everywhere. <laughs> so I don't know if the people were excited of my preaching or they're excited they're going to eat soon. <laughs> now, that, that's a little bit hard to determine, but... You know, as a, as a pastor, what can you do? You have to understand people too. But not, compl- not compromise what the Lord is wanting us to have. You see, I don't know what happened today. I, I should have been finished by now. But I'm still doing the introduction. <laughs> I was talking about crisis event in the life of a believer. There are crises. And sometimes it's not related to the church, but it affects the church. It can be a financial difficulty. It can be sickness, you or a member of your loved ones. It can be that suddenly you have no more that appetite for ministry or even going to church. It can be that You're just lazy or complacent. Or maybe you want to take a break. And I always say to my people, take a break. You in lead ministry, you take a break. But someone took me literally and took a break for a long time. (laughs) Until he he gets called in ministry and his axe head dull, worse, lost. I didn't mean that. And when they come back after that refreshing, I mean they feel revived, fresh, strong. Here you take a vacation, you come back, and you go, you don't feel like doing anything. <laughs> Why was that? Can I talk to you like this? Because it's, it's relational, it's, it's practical. And we want the word of God alive, active. It can rebuke, it can encourage, it can teach. That's the beauty of the Word of God. And when the people start mind, you see? I got a Rolex watch. Amen. No, Cambodia. <laughs> That's why you come to Cambodia with me, and I'll show you to where to get stuff, like cheap. <laughs> like Omega. You only know Hong Kong, but Cambodia. Ravens, come to Cambodia. <laughs> nice shoes, come to Cambodia. <laughs> it's fun too. But you need to be also prepared when you go up the villages to walk in the mud. Yeah. All right? But don't walk with your uh, Hermes bag or shoes. And... But it's really good. So everyone has got a crisis in their life. It can be broken relationships, fighting with the husband, fighting with the wife. Amen. Sometimes the, the wife, they, 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 they fight themselves. <laughs> they don't know what clothes to wear, <laughs> what the, the shade, and they got the clothes, and what the shade of the eye, <laughs> you know, and they have to wipe it off again, you see? <laughs> Change color. And, and they like the color, but they didn't like the dress. They take off again that one and go another one until it's okay. And before they know it, the event is finished. <laughs> and 
It's funny because at church, it, it really did happen. And why did you not come to church? I didn't know what to wear. <laughs> I, I thought that was just simple. And my wife explained to me, you don't understand women. <laughs> it, it takes time for them to choose their clothes and a pair of clothing, shoes, matching bag, purse, or whatever, and the shade and color of their face, and sometimes their hair. And <laughs> How about the men? The men, no problem. Too easy in that regard. But when it comes to ministry, a lot of men are lazy. Axe head. And I was just so impressed. The young people were here early. I said, wow. And they are not sleepy. They're so alive. They're talking to each other. And this is what we're going to do. And Wow. I'm so blessed. You see, come to my church. You will love us too. That is why we have a symbiotic relationship, this church and our church. So stay here, okay? Don't go away. There's more in store for you and us. And soon, we will be doing that exchange. Our people there and our, your people here. Amen. Believe it. And my church in Australia is open to any one of you. Don't say it's only for pastors. I mean, inviting pastors, but only Pastor Phil comes. Their place. I tell you something. Talking about Acts here, there are pastors. I'm recorded, right? That's okay. It's true. There are some ministers who are, whose Acts heads are dull. Pastor, sharpen it more. You need help. I can help you. Couscous. <laughs> but make sure when you go, Pastor, take me with you. And that is why when I was growing as a boy, I saw this. And I was the boy going close to the elders of the church. I'm doing something, but my ear is always listening. What do they talk about? And I did learn from the elders of the church. Before I know it, I was walking with them. To others, they're still there, sitting in the pew. Same chair. <laughs> every Sunday. Every month. Year after year. That's... You, the axe head will get dull if you stay in the same place. So, what will I do that will not offend my members, Lord, I said. Oh, God said, do the Red Sea crossing. So, after the praise and worship and other programs and all that, I encourage them to, you know, shake someone's hand and all that and don't go back to where they are seated. Get another place. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's, it's good to... Get out of your comfort zone. Amen. All right? So hopefully next Sunday you will be seated in a different chair. <laughs> hey, have fun. Enjoy church. Oh, my. Because if you are at the same spot, I don't know, you're going to get bored. <laughs> it's like you're sitting there and there's a ministry that, that needs help and support. You're just going to sit down there and watch. Hey, well, that's good. It will be more encouraging if you, if you get up out of your seat and shake their hands and say nice words to them in private. That would be good. But the church has got, has got its own crisis event. Well, it can be the death of a pastor. You know, when, when we mourn of the death of a beloved pastor, like I remember Pastor Liberato. Uh, I, I really mourned for him because he, I, I like him scratching my back. He's massaging me all the time. But he's telling me something. Oh, Baruch, don't leave the young people. Don't leave the young people. 
To this day, I remember that. That's why I love the young people. I get excited when I see the young people. I feel young again. Church camps, there's always different, different ideas. It's not the same old, same old. When I go to the church camp, I'm sure um, to those who grow up with me in, in Hawaii, I always pack myself up, not with chips, drinks. What else do you bring, guys? Games? Uh, now you have the iPad. Anything but the Word of God. So I pack myself with what skit I'm going to present. If there's a campfire and there's a, a competition there, I'm always ready with those ones. Uh, when we go on in a camp and, you know, is, is it, do you still do it? When you get your food, you need to recite the Scripture? No more. During our time with Mitchell Kanekoa, we made sure that you will not eat if you don't have your word ready. So you go there and say your scripture. And those wise kids, they say, the easiest one, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. After three people, there comes another one. In the beginning God created. <laughs> and then the fourth one says, Jesus wept. <laughs> Jesus wept. In the beginning God Amazing. <laughs> Sharpen the accent. In the churches, there's, there's problem in Ephesus. There's problem in the church of Corinth. There's a problem in the church of Philadelphia. There's a problem in the church of Laodicea. There's a problem in the church of IAFB. So many problems. Oh, this pastor left. Oh, there's a problem with the members of the church. Oh, they left everyone and all that. Forget about those ones. The main thing is that God is the one moving us. Amen. And when we see that, we remove all those strains of jealousy, strains of bitterness, strains, um, strains of offense. So wherever God leads you, Praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, we should all be happy. Even, even the, the churches before, they were like that. They're moving from place to place. And it's hard to, for the devil to keep up. <laughs> These guys are moving here, and they moved there. And they thought we got them in the bag already. They won't praise the Lord. But they went to that Elk Grove church, and they're praising the Lord again. Or they went to that church, and they're praising still the Lord. Man, amazing. But be careful when the devil comes and steer the waters and it's not the same spirit that we are hearing right now. You understand what I'm saying? So there are situations, there are crises. I remember Pastor John Austin of Lakewood Church when he passed away. I remember the testimony of, of, of Joel Austin. He said, I didn't think that I was the one that will be chosen by the Lord and my father because I have a bright brother by the name of Paul. He's the intelligent one. He's the charismatic one. I'm the one who stays in the background doing the, the television and, and all that. That was me. I have no intention of preaching. I didn't have this charisma. His axe head was lost then. And now he he realized in the spirit what God has given him, and he regained that axe head and look at him now. You may be a sleeping giant in the church. You don't know what you have. You don't know what God has placed in you. But you see yourself in the mirror, and you are the same old, same old. Put a color here, put a color there, and some color in here, and smile here, and put down... Discover your real you. Yes. And that, that, that accent that had been lost for so long, I mean, bring it out and then use it and be yourself. Amen. You think God, when he lines us up, and, oh, I like this one, he's guapo. Oh, I don't like this one, he's ugly. I, I like this one because he dresses up well. Oh, I like this one because he won't do like that. Everyone before the Lord are the same. But this is important. 
at a certain point in time, that axe head need to be, needs to be used at a significant point in your life. You just don't use your axe head just for the sake of using it. There is a purpose. Like, why do we come to church? There must be a purpose. Think deeper. And this group of prophets, they, they think they know everything. But the man of God says, wait, I'm seeing something here. And then they pray, begin to press him. But he wouldn't listen because he knows what God has revealed to him. That's revelation knowledge. You see, and this is how you're going to use, how I'm going to use my axe head. Even in preaching, there's a time and there's a season. But just the same, whether in season or out of season, I'm ready to do the fight. It's like joining the military, special ops. They train very hard, right? When there's no operation going on, well, they relax. They play football or things like that. But when there's a call, even like one second notice, time to go, and they go. And they do the thing that they were trained to do. It's the same thing in the church, even more powerful. What have you been trained to do in the church? I'm not talking about chismis or gossip. That's not good. I mean... Prayer warrior? Fine. You see, even now, sorry, 1227.59. Blame it on the people in Australia who are praying for me right now. <laughs> because as I travel, there are people who are praying and fasting for me and the events that are happening in America. <coughs> if somebody can pray for you, they don't even know you. They don't even come here. How much more you who are here having that convention? Mm-hmm. I mean, because the axe head has been, or maybe a lost axe head. And I do believe as I am conversing with Pastor Phil that God is setting in motion changes because we need change. Change in our situation. You know, there are some effects when we lose our axe head. We shut down our vision. We have low self-esteem. We have choked faith in the law. It's, It's hard to move. It's hard to encourage ourselves. It's hard to move forward as a body of Christ. And I was telling my church when we have been challenged here and there. Because somebody doesn't speak in tongues and doesn't believe in speak in tongues. And there's some others who think they feel better than, than their set men and all that. And there are some who feel that they've not been uh, spoken to or taken care of. In, in Tagalog, they call it kulang sa pansin. Huh? KSP. Who are KSPs here? <laughs> nah, I'm a Boy Scout. <laughs> I, you see, we have paralyzed ministries. We lose our focus. We are on a stalemate. Discouragement sets in, listening to other different voices. And it is hard. Our work is doomed, kaput, finished. Much work to be done, but we have less resources. What would happen to a church losing its axe head? And members losing their axe head. And no wonder we are not advancing in the kingdom of God. Now, there's a new thing that is happening in Australia. I don't know where I came from. I don't know how I got there. 
but one pastor by the name of Daniel Nalia, who was persecuted in Saudi Arabia together with one after the other with Pastor Wally Magdangal. That's why they, they connect. And the Islamists are beginning to move into Australia. You understand? Christians are quiet, complacent, axe head, lost or not sharp. And we are looking at not only us, but the generations and generations and generations to come. Our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. What will happen if these Islamists will dominate Australia and they will be subjected to the rule of Sharia or the Quran? You understand what I'm saying? I cannot judge, jump in the church and praise the Lord without doing anything. Silent no more. One thing led to another, and I got into this pastor, Daniel Nalia, and we jived, and he asked me, will you sit in the state executive for Victoria to help out? Well, I have long pushed out politics in my life, Pastor Daniel, but with the little knowledge that I know, however I can help, I'll help. He's asking me to run for senator in this coming election, but I begged off because I'm not called for that anymore. Anyway, I have a member who is qualified to run for senator. Take him. And so one of my members is running for senator. And I have a friend who is in the city council where I am, and uh, her name is, pray for her, her name is uh, Rosalie Crestani. He's, She's running for, for set the Senate too. So we, we, we have something in our hands because all we want is godly leadership. If our leaders in government are not godly and God-fearing, it, we will get affected somehow. And people don't see that. And people even the church, why do you go into politics? Why you join this? Wait, we are not silent anymore. We are, want godly leadership. The current prime minister now, this newly installed prime minister, he's got a front bencher who is a Muslim. Never in the history of Australia did one pledge allegiance oath before a Quran on TV. How can you do that? A Christian nation. Axe head of the country, lost. You're seeing what I'm seeing? You're hearing what the Lord wants you to hear? Look big. Broaden what you're seeing. We have the church life. We don't even understand it. But how about the big things of God? When we speak the word of God, like what we are ta we're talking about now, we are talking about the kingdom of God. Big time. And we have a part to play. Maybe. Your church is an axe head. I lost it. Maybe my church is that axe head for that situation. Because when they needed that axe, they didn't need that axe before. But we are small now, but we want a bigger place. And this is the time that they needed the axe. And this is the time that they need to work. But the axe head is not there. Oh, there's their axe, but the axe is not sharp. And it has come to a time such as this in the country of Australia. Who will stand up for those who tell us we are all infidels? And so this pastor, the Daniel Nali, I saw him in the vision. He's like the Jeremiah in the old days. A voice crying in the wilderness. until people begin to realize what is happening with us. And he said to us, he is very knowledgeable and he loves God so much. Do you see what happened to France? They allowed all this and there are now more than 60 Sharia zones. Anyone who is not a Muslim who goes there is a Ghana. You lose your rights. And they start in, in, in Australia, one street at a time. And they're buying council people with their own money. And yet we give them welfare benefits and all that. And the people are still 
death, doing nothing, afraid of their lives, because that's their way, sowing fear to people. And Pastor Daniel Nalia, who gets oftentimes death threats, you can take me if you like. But if something happens to me, I have asked already someone higher, bigger, even than you, to take you too. He's talking about God. Amen. And my God is bigger than you. So the axe head, that our, we are sharpening our axe head. And this is what we're going to do. I remember Pastor Rod Parsley before. And he, and he was preaching in his Harvest Church. And uh, he said, silent no more. It's, that, it's enough. It's time for me to step down. Somebody will take care of my church. And I'm going to go and fight you know, those who are opposed to the government ruleship imposing the constitution of God. Imagine we pledge allegiance to, to God only, to, to, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the God who showed himself to us through Jesus Christ. And now we are, they are pledging allegiance to another God. How can that be? Now, something is happening. So I just want to let you know that to, to encourage you, maybe that one day we will change our thinking in how we approach church. John Maxwell once said that if we change our thinking, it will change our feelings. And if our feelings will change, our actions will change also. And if our actions changes, our way of life will change too. People in the church who doesn't want to hear raw and meaningful words of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want. But Jesus doesn't force anyone to, hear, to listen to him. That's always his nature, giving always the latitude of patience and the opportunity to be real, at least real in your heart. Amen. Seek the Lord and pray fast. And this has been my experience too. You see, the other point I want to show you is when we lose our axe head, we are prone to use more of our individual physical, mental um, strength rather than the talent or the skill that God gave us, including faith. And so maybe these guys who lost the axe they want still to build. And so what was left is the handle of the axe. And they, and they beat that tree, thinking that, you know, one day it will fall. Maybe. But how, for how long? Are there many of you in the church who have been doing like this? One week? One month? One year? Two years? Three years? And it's true. Local church, assembly church. God's ways are different. And sometimes we can put a lot of confidence in us, in our flesh, in human wisdom, and leave no room for God to work in your heart. And there's a problem if we do that. So remember what Paul said, not to accomplish the things in the spirit with fleshly things. My church once asked, and these are legitimate questions. I don't hate those inquiries. I love them. I love discussions. I love to engage with them and, and see what comes out of it and bring out the best of the best of God. Pastor, we should do this. We should do this structure like this. I'm listening. We can try. It doesn't work, then it doesn't work. Can it? We want to build a, um, a structured church, and they begin to tell me, look at the church of uh, that Glenn Waverly, Mark Connor. Go, you see how big they are now? Da, da, da. Why are you comparing my ch our church to their church? I remember when <clears throat> I was training as a, a young pastor in Australia, and I have this man of faith. Well, 
your accountability or your assignment is before the Lord. Whatever He gives you, He is not too small to do things. Well, Ben, would you rather that we hire Darling Check and spend so much for love offering and we'll have a big concert? Maybe it's an overflow and you put all these things and you have a big crowd in your church and then the following day, there's no one anymore there. Is that what you like? Or you want anointed people in the church who will do the work of the Lord. They stay united. When two or more are gathered in His name, there He shall be in their midst. You know, some people who are ignorant of the Word of God, they, they do the physical thing. You see, that's what the devil is trying to do. So if there's one, two, or three, or even four of us, then God is with us. Not quite. What the Word of God says is that when two or more are gathered in His name, one or two are gathered united. Same mind, spirit, same heart, same direction, you know, not different one. Then Jesus will be there. And the greatest miracle is the presence of God, not you or me. Amen. But where we are united, that's when He comes in. That's when He turns up and something is done. But if you are disunited, you are diff talking, di talking different things and all that. You're telling pastor this and that. And pastor said no, and you feel offended. We cannot agree on this one, even if we are present together, because there's hurt, there's, there's something different. We are not united in spirit and heart. You understand? You understand the predicament of being a pastor, but I have to sharpen my axe head. I said, you guys, even husband and wife, you can even agree, even with your children. Look at your elders in the church, the pastor. There are as many personalities as there are members in the church. Can you see your pastor trying his best to, to accommodate each one? But you only see yourself. But. Come on, let's all sharpen our accent. And what is going in the Australian church right now, God has flushed out those who have different leanings, but... I, I pray that God will correct them somewhere and they will listen to God and come back. And that's, that's all I'm praying for because we love them just the same. When you get more mature in the spirit, when you know more about the dynamics of God and how, how, how these things are playing up, oh, you, you feel bad for those who couldn't take it yet. But you pray for them. You just continue to love them and accept them as they are. So, <clears throat> one thing is that even if we do things in our physical strength, or we should do this, we should do that, those are all good things. I'm, I'm not canning out all those things. But when it, if it replaces the, the spiritual things, how it is done in the spirit, um, regardless of how insane it might be for us, the instruction of God, it is from the Lord. The reason I say that is that was it logical for them to march 13 times around Jericho for it to fall down? Sounds crazy, right? Yeah. Logical mind would say, oh, just get the howitzer and all that, or just ram them with the, with the Abrams or the tanks and done, finished. But the Lord said, no. March six times, once a day, and on the seventh day, you march seven times. So how many did he circle? Seven times? Thirteen times. You didn't know that. Thirteen times they went around and then they shout. That's crazy. Blow the trumpet. It went down. There may be some things that we don't understand when our leaders tells, tell us this stuff, but they know what they're talking about. Respishu, Pastor Kanekoa would say. When he called me in, two, when was that, Pastor Phil? 2002? Hong Kong? And I was in Australia. I got your number somewhere. And it was a shock to me. You're still in the role. At that time, I was serving in an Australian church before I moved to the satellite church of Pastor Yonggi Cho, where I served for four years. Come to Hong Kong. Meet me at 2.30 at the Hilton Hotel. Bye. <laughs> what would you do if Pastor Phil, Phil told you that? Not Dr. Phil, yeah? <laughs> Pastor Phil. <laughs> if 
Pastor Phil calls you and then, uh, meet me at 2 o'clock. What is it, Pastor? Oh, just come at 2 o'clock. You know. well, I don't know what he wants. I have a very important date. I'm going to lose my girlfriend. This, is my, this will be my first girlfriend. If, uh. But at that time, Pastor Phil is calling you. What would you do? Oh. You don't want to lose a girlfriend in exchange for uh, arranging chairs, right? But you didn't know that arranging chairs will lead you to a deep ministry in the Lord. Yeah. You feel sorry at face value, but long term, we lose so much. Has that happened to you? Anyway, going back, the lost accent, um, people using more of their mental, physical prowess than the God-given talents and skills. See, that's the effect of it. It's just, it's just like, imagine this, using the handle of the axe to, to let that tree fall. It just doesn't make sense. And whether we like it or not, we've been doing that for a long time in the church. It's hard to admit, but when you admit the truth, it's very um, transforming. It's just a release. Now, I, I did have a problem adjusting with the, the pastor's life before because I can short circuit because of my personality. I'm, I'm, I'm very regimented, you know. But the word shepherd, take care of the sheep. They don't know what they're doing. So I'm beginning to learn that. And I have to sharpen my accent there. Because somewhere along the line, I lost it. And now I involve my leaders to have a dialogue with me. And when we have a dialogue, even if we are heated in the meeting room about what we talked about, that's nothing personal. Unlike before, they don't like the pastor and then they leave the church. And they just don't leave the church. They take their families with them. They take their friends with them. They take everyone else with them. Now... They want to leave, but they don't want to leave because the Spirit of the Lord has set himself up in his church. So it's wonderful to see God working in our lives. And there is no substitute for a lost axe head. There is no substitute for an answered prayer. There is no substitute for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is no substitute in praying and fasting. There's no substitute in, in, in hearing the word of God with eagerness and sincerity to receive from him and learn from him. Because one day, you and I will be in the battlefield, will be in the front line. By then, you are equipped and trained to do the work of a soldier who is in the front line. Remember, if... In the real physical war, for example, if you are there in the front line and you don't know what to expect, you will become crazy. And you know that. Some of our, your military people, they come home crazy. Even in the Philippines, my cousin who is in the military, when the military, um, they go to the Tabak Division, which is the dreaded division in, in the military because they are always given the uh, assignment to, when they say go, it's search, kill, and destroy. So when they move forward, regardless of who is there, young, um, old, women, children, male, female, everyone in their way dies. And got crazy because of, you know, what he's seeing. Accent. We want, there's no replacement for seeing our youth filled with the Holy Spirit. Anointed services. Passion for the Word of God. Desire for authentic and true spiritual revival. That is what we want. Not every convention we get the feel during that four days and it wanes so quickly. We want to take home something to our members. We want to take home something for ourselves. You know, I don't know if, if you have experienced this, but 
like the prophet of God, the food that God brings can last for a while. I have energy and stamina in the spirit because of the things that God's shown in my life. In the same way as Jesus told the disciples of Jesus, which the disciples thought that Jesus was hungry because maybe he has not eaten for several days and they have a time to rest. They say, get food for Jesus. He must be tired. He must be hungry. And Jesus said to them, I have food that you know not of. I have food that you know not of. And you want to have this food. Now, this is very important as I close. The lost axe head. It is not always that you lose your axe head on purpose. Many of us, we lose our axe head not on purpose, not with evil intent. It can be that you are doing multiplicity of ministries. You want to do this, you want to do that, you want to do this, you want to do that. And the result is burnout. Have you experienced burnout in ministry? You do this and you can't rest, you don't. See, because you want to be there, all of them, at the same time. What happens is burnout. You lose your effectiveness. You lose your axe head. I always tell my people which is the predominant ministry that God is calling you right now. Just right now. Don't worry about the rest. For now, you stay there and be effective where God's planted you. And he will elevate you again. As he said, from one degree of glory to the next. You may have lost your axe head, but not on purpose. It just happened that way. There was a time that I got burned out. There was a time that people were leaving the church, and of course, you got affected. You see? But it's not your own doing. Sometimes you lose your accent by doing a noble or important thing. What they were doing was not a bad thing. But somehow they lost the accent. Worse, it was a borrowed thing. Have you lost something that you borrowed and you were so stressed out? What are you going to do now? Maybe you borrowed money and you cannot repay. And they're collecting back. You had the money, but you lost it. You, you went to eat that, that all you can eat with your friends. Instead of paying your debt, so you squandered it. Because the stomach is more important than anything else. Right? Mm. You see, you may have not lost it purposely, but in the course of your following the Lord, somehow you lost it. Even Elijah did lose it. Am I the only one here, Lord? Quiet. I have 7,000 more that no one knows. I have a remnant whom they know. So you may not be a mega church, but the Lord knows your service to him. You're as powerful as one who's got many. Anyway, just like Elisha, he knows his wares. When he was surrounded by so many armies with different leaders, he said, there are more who are with us than those who are against us. Mm-hmm. And then Gahash, he wanted to know. And so he asked God to open his eyes, and he saw the angels of God with them, so many. This is what the church is missing. I mean, not your church. The whole church. We have angelic beings with us to help us in our fight. And if we just preach a good sermon, something that will please the audience or the hearers, then I would have lost what has been asked of me by the Lord to tell you today. And it is not like a joke traveling hours upon hours just to come here to deliver a message of the Lord. How many preachers have told you that before? There are a lot of prophets. There are a lot of apostles who are coming to our land. You don't know who's who now. I mean, and I pray that the Lord will open our eyes of understanding. Maybe the accent is discernment, but we lost it. 
as I go around the church, I was once like them before because I couldn't understand, I couldn't bear more. Laughing on the outside, but crying inside. And, and I really feel for, for people like that. So you lost the axe You show more of your physical and mental strength rather than the Spirit of God and the talents and the gifts, the skills that He gave you. You did not lose it on purpose. And the last thing is that you can recover back the lost axe head. A lot of Christians today are not happy with their Christian lives. Somehow, they have lost their relationship with God. I don't know what kind of relationship they have with God. I cannot judge them. But I know one who loves God loves what Jesus loves doing. They read the Word of God. They listen to the Word of God. They soak in the Word of God. They want to be filled by the Spirit of God. When they speak, they have signs and wonders following them. It is not just jumping up and down when it's praise and worship time and you look dead afterwards. The, the people of God, they know. But somehow, they have lost their accent. And where did you lose it? The man of God said, there in the water. And he got a stick. And he placed that stick where that axe head was lost. And it floated. And the message for this, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Your fellowship with the Lord may have been broken, may have been strained. You don't feel the joy. Even when you are on trial, even when you have adversities, challenges in life. But when you have that stick representing Calvary, the cross of Jesus Christ, you can find your way back. You can. Maybe you're, you have drowned. When that stick comes, when the cross of Christ comes back to you, you, he will float you back and bring back that joy of your salvation. Amen. And you will no longer be the same again. This is real Christianity. This is the thing that God wants us to be. A lot of Christians today, especially those who are on trial, especially those who have challenges as a person, as a family, as a local church, as an assembly, as a nation. But when the cross of Christ comes, he will make us afloat again and we recover everything that we lost. Yeah. And we have our axe head back. Let me ask you, where did you lose your axe head? There are things in life that we don't want to go back. That's fine. But in this example, the man of God asked, where did you lose it? Go back and trace it so that we can find it back. And when it comes back, pick it up. Don't just watch it. Take it, appropriate it, and use it. This time, without fear or trepidation, use it and tell the devil that you have recovered your axe head. You have recovered your passionate relationship with God and that you are new. And that is the message of the Lord for you today. Maybe you're thinking like, well, I'm not used in the church. Um, I'm so affected by people coming and leaving the church. Oh, I don't know where our church is really going. Oh, I really don't like that pastor. Oh, I don't like that leader. Oh, somewhere, or maybe you, I don't know how to read the Bible. I, I want to be this. I want to be that. And, and in the process, you lose your accent. They're all legitimate things they're bringing, but in the process, you lost it. Maybe you're working so hard and you don't find any rest. You got burned out and, and, and things are not just happening to you. Maybe it's a broken relationship with your husband and your wife. You know, God is a God of second chances, a third and a fourth, the fifth, sixth. It doesn't matter. Where did you lose it? And God will going to bring it back to you. Maybe not the same people, but he's just talking to you personally. And he says to you, it's a new day. It's a new beginning for you. Come on. Did you know that I died for you? 
that stake representing Calvary, the cross of Jesus Christ, that's sufficient for you to fight the devil. When You know, when the devil sees the cross, he's so afraid. But how many of us using the cross of Christ in fighting the demons and the evil that comes against us? Doesn't even know. Just recently, churches from other denominations, they call me. I say, not that I want to lift myself up or my chair. Pastor, have you got an experience of casting out demons because we see some spirits in the house? Why don't you call your pastor to do that? Or your church leaders? And I go, oh, but we heard that you have an experience and that you love kicking devils. I go, I do. I really do. I really do. And when he torments me like what I've, 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 I've been through, he says, is that all you've got? And I come with the power of God and I see the devil running because I fear no man. I fear no evil. I only fear my God. And I go, many times I lost my accent. Many times it's not sharpened. And I go to train again and do the things that I love doing. People come, can you bless my home? And I said, why don't you call your pastor and bless your home? But we want you. That's all right. Okay, we bless your home. But more than your home, let me bless you. That the devil will not come to you, but he will come to you. But when he comes, you know how to handle him. Okay? And uh, it's just awesome to destroy the works of the evil one. I, I don't know, but I, I'm fascinated destroying the works of the evil one. I, I'm, I'm fascinated destroying every mark he's got. I'm fascinated, like, taking the, taking the devil and... Him bringing his tools, implements, and instruments of destruction. I cry when I see the people of God being lambasted by the devil, not knowing what to do. They're being tormented by the devil, and they think it's just themselves. But there's a greater power that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But on the other hand, I want to bring the light of Jesus so they can see that there is someone who loves them so much. The one who died for them. Not just a recitation of what we have learned in Bible school or whatever. This time, there is this living word of God in us. And you can tell if the person is spirit-filled or not. Because he doesn't faint, he, he doesn't retreat, he doesn't withdraw during the thick of the fight with the enemy, the real enemy. And so today, when we have the cross of Jesus Christ, bringing back your axe head or sharpening yours today, hey, we have every right to be happy. The joy of your salvation is back. And so here we are, ready, prepared, to fight the good fight of faith. For you are not the victims, but you are the victors. You are the head and not the tail. And you are more, more than conqueror in Christ. And the word of God for you today is this. Your axe head may be lost. Go back to where you lost it and recover yourself along the way, knowing that God is for you and not against you. Use that stick. Use the cross of Jesus Christ to regain what the devil has stolen. And I can promise you that whatever the, Lord, the devil has, has, has stolen from you, he will return it seven times more. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. God bless you all. You've been very good today. Thank you. Thank you.